so please welcome on stage Jared Spool. Good morning. <laughs> wow. <laughs> How we doing? Can you change the resolution? Like you change the resolution. Okay. Uh, nope, it's set. We're set. Yeah. Okay. There we go. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm internet sensation and teen heartthrob Jared Spool. <laughs> I am so happy to be here. This is very exciting. I have to admit, I've never had dancers before. That was awesome. I'm a little scared about this symbol. <laughs> that freaks me a little. <laughs> Putting on a conference like this takes a lot of effort, and the folks behind the scenes, uh, Zhao and all the other folks, did a fantastic job. Let's make some noise for them. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. It's appropriate that we have a time machine because I want to go back to 2010 and to a pretty unremarkable day when a designer named Tyler Thompson went to JFK Airport in New York, walked up to a kiosk and proceeded to get this piece of paper. Now, millions of people have gotten this piece of paper before him and he'd gotten it many times before but on this particular unremarkable day tyler looked at this thing and wondered about its design he wondered about why it was the way it was and he wrote a blog post about it he even described what he thought this boarding pass was trying to tell him he wrote hello there thanks for flying delta I am sure, no doubt, you are trying to figure out what the fuck to do with this piece of paper you have in your hand right now. You're confused, lost, and just want to get on your flight. It's cool, we don't care, and we sure as hell don't want to make this process easy and enjoyable for you. Instead, we hired a small blind parakeet to lay out your boarding pass, you know, just to keep you guessing. Have fun. Tyler went back to his shop at some point and decided he could do better. And so what he decided to do was to create this. And this is a gorgeous boarding pass. And if you look at the design of this, it's got all the right things. It's got nice crisp typography. The ability to hone in on the right information is clear. The colors are crisp. The design is aesthetically pleasing. Everything about this is brilliant. Around the same time, Another designer named Dustin Curtis uh, found himself in a situ similar situation on a similar day in which he was uh, interested, for the most part, in understanding why he was looking at this. This is the American Airlines website of 2010, and like Tyler Thompson, Dustin had a similar reaction and felt the need to do something similar. He also wrote a blog post for which he wrote an open letter to the president of American Airlines saying, if I was running a company with the distinction and history of American Airlines, I would be embarrassed, no, ashamed, to have a website with a customer experience as terrible as the one you have now. And he too, like Tyler, decided he was going to redesign the website and came up with this, a beautifully made uh, design of a website. So this is what designers do. They design. But what actually is design? Well, design, in its essence, is the rendering of intent. Designers have an intention 
They want to get something done in the world, and they decide that they're going to bring it to life. They're going to render it in that world. And that's exactly what Dustin Curtis did. He thought the intention of the original website wasn't good, he intended to make something better, and he produced a great design. A few days after Tyler had posted his redesign of the American Airlines website, he got an email. The email was from one of the designers at American Airlines, who went on to explain why although very nicely done, Dustin's website could never be built at American Airlines. That the way that the organization worked, the needs of the organization, the different groups who needed to have things on the homepage, the way politics worked, the way the teams worked, would never have happened, would never make this website capable because there were just too many voices, too many things that were getting in the way. The email was very well written. And with the author's permission, Dustin posted it on his website anonymously. And even though it was anonymous, there just aren't that many designers at American Airlines. It wasn't hard for them to figure out who wrote the email, and they fired him. Design is the rendering of intent. Intent is a key word there. What was Dustin's intention? Was it to get a designer fired? Because that's what happened through the sequence of events. Just making something look great isn't necessarily going to get the outcomes we want. What Dustin didn't take into account was something else, context. Context is where design happens. If we don't pay attention to context, our designs can't work. Let's go back for a moment to Tyler Thompson's original redesigned boarding pass. Because this boarding pass is a work of nice and well thought out design. Tyler is a designer. We know this because, well, we did. <laughs> there we go. Uh, we know this because everybody thinks they're a designer, right? What's interesting about Tyler's boarding pass is how it would need to be rendered in the world. Let's take it apart for a second. See, this boarding pass, this boarding pass is a four-color boarding pass, right? It requires a four-color printer to produce this thing. The printers that Delta had to make boarding passes were black and white. It also had bleed edging. For those of you who haven't had a chance to work in print, this means that the ink goes right up to the edge of the page. Well, in order to make that happen, you have to have one of two things. You either have to have paper that's, uh, uh, that is cut such that you can have the ink go beyond it and then you cut it out, or you have to have pre-printed stock. The other interesting thing about this is that it is a 300 dot per inch image, but the printers that Delta had could only do 75 dots per inch. And it was printed on a white stock. I don't know what that is. Hello. I hate computers today. <laughs> Let's try this again.
Okay, where were we? Let's go here. Here we go. It's printed on a white stock. There we go. And the white stock is, uh, uh, is what is required to get those white letters because there is no way on a four-color printer to print white ink. Right? There is, there's no such thing. It's the absence of ink that gets you there. So in order for Tyler's boarding pass to actually come to life, to actually be rendered in the world, Delta would have to replace about 10,000 printers that they had in the field. They would have to change the paper size and add the ability to cut for bleeds. And they'd have to create an entire supply chain for colored inks. Thermal printers, which is what Delta was using, don't have inks. So they'd have to create an entire supply system to make sure that every printer had all four inks at all times. Otherwise, they could not print boarding passes for customers. So now, when we think of it this way, which of these boarding passes is the better design? Which one is perfect? Without context, we can't tell what a good design really is. And this is the problem with poor design. Poor design is what happens when we make bad decisions. And it comes from one of two reasons. Either we have the right intention, but we've rendered it poorly, or we have a poor intention, which we've rendered beautifully. Which one is Tyler's boarding pass? Which one is Dustin's website? If we're going to make great design, we need to think about both intention and rendering. And our skills for rendering are key for this. This is the map of six, Magic Mountain's Six Flags. It's a uh, theme park in Southern California. And you can see from this map that they have packed a lot into this park. There are 84 attractions in the park, and they number them all the way through the park. And the idea is, is that you take this map and you use this to have your day in the park. You're supposed to come in from the bottom and head to the left. It's designed to get you to go that way. You start by getting in a very long line for the first attraction. It then shows you, uh, that you then get on a very short ride. You then step off the ride and have a far too long episode of throwing up and then get into another long line and then have, go on another ride and throw up a little bit more. And that's the adventure that the folks at Six Flags want you to have. And they number every single attraction so that you don't miss one. They don't want you to miss a single thing. It's all about making sure you get on everything you paid for. Now, compare that to the map from Disney's Walt Disney World Magic Kingdom. And the Magic Kingdom map is interesting because it doesn't actually number every ride. It doesn't even label every ride. In fact, you can't see the rides. Sure, if you know what the architecture of some of the rides are, like Space Mountain, Mountain uh, you can tell exactly where it is. But if you don't know that, if that's new to you, this map doesn't really tell you much about the rides. And it's not that Disney's ashamed of their rides. They have fantastic rides. They have as many rides as Six Flags does. But Disney is not about the rides. Disney is about something completely different. It's about how you move from one place to another. See, if you go to Walt Disney World, say with a six-year-old, one of your days is likely to start 
with something known as the character breakfast. The character breakfast is an opportunity for you and your six-year-old to get up close and personal to what is, in essence, a creepy guy in an animal suit. (laughs) And you and your six-year-old and the creepy guy in the animal suit, the three of you will work together to create what will become the most expensive breakfast you will ever pay for. And when you are done, everybody will love it. Your six-year-old will love it. You will love it. The guy in the animal suit seems to really like it. (laughs) Everybody loves it. And that's just the start of your day. And then you wander out into the park and you have an adventure and you have another adventure and it all is seamless. Everything seems to blend together. There's no discrete activity. Everything leads to the next. And before you know it, the sky erupts and there's a a fireworks show, a fireworks show that's been completely designed to... Uh, uh, wherever you are, the sound is perfectly synchronized. It doesn't matter whether you're close to the fireworks or far away, the speed of light and the speed of sound have been merged together because they have embedded speakers into the pavement to make sure that you hear the exact moment you're supposed to hear when the fireworks light up. They've thought about everything. So much so that when the fireworks end and you take your exhausted six-year-old and you put them on your shoulder and you head back not to your hotel, because Disney does not have hotels. Disney has resorts. You go back to your resort, you open the room door, and you discover that while you were gone, someone had come in and made little origami animals out of your towels. And if your six-year-old left little toys in the room, the toys are now organized around the animals as if they'd all been playing together and then collapsed flat on the bed, just like in the movie when the humans walk in. Because that's how Disney thinks. The folks at Six Flags, they think about the activities. They think about these discrete things you're going to do Whereas the folks at Disney, they think about experience. They think about what is the experience you're going to have. They fill in the gaps. It's all seamless. Now, as designers, we need to have a design process that is equally as seamless we have to think of our design process as a designed experience. Design processes these days come in many forms. One form is that they come in is uh, these days rendered as diamonds. This is the DMI double diamond process. These days, whenever I see design processes, they're either diamonds or they're loops. We've entered the jewelry portion of the UX world. And this process is just one of thousands, and yet we fixate on process. Everybody talks about process. We, we ask each other, what's your process? What's your process? When we have interviews, we ask candidates, what is your process? As if we're ever going to let them use their process. Hell, we're probably not even gonna let them use our process because we never use our process. Yet we, we fetishize over all these processes And as I mentioned, there's lots of them. The double diamond one where on the left you're designing the right thing and on the right you're designing the thing right. Right. What was Tyler Thompson and Dustin Curtis's process? Well, they had their own. It was called, I'm pissed off and I'm gonna show you how to do it right. That was their process. But if we're gonna design a process, we have to think about what does that mean? do we really want out of our process? 
we have to answer some important questions. Right? Who is going to be using this process? Is it just people with the name designer, or are there other people who are involved in this? How will those people add any value to the process? How do we make sure that we get the most value out of them through their participation? Some of these people are going to be new to this. How do we make sure we support them? How do we introduce the process to people who haven't been involved before? When it goes well, who is going to get the credit? And when it goes wrong, who is going to take the blame? If we're going to create a process, we have to create a process that's inclusive, that actually makes sure all the people in the organization who have something to add, some value to give us, they are included. Going back into the time machine a little bit more, I want to go back to uh, 1968, 63, I'm sorry, where the, on a completely unremarkable day, a couple of researchers, psychological uh, behavioral researchers, published a paper called The Effects of Experimenter, Bi Experimenter Bias on the Albino Rat, uh, Robert Rosenthal and K.L. Fode. And this paper, which most people don't know about, had a dramatic effect on how we think about design and design process. And it started with an experiment. Robert Rosenthal, the, one of the researchers, on an unremarkable day, went to his local psychological testing supply store and he purchased, like you do, a whole bunch of laboratory rats. He put the rats in a shopping cart, went through checkout, brought them home, and put them in his office in a couple of cages. And after he got the rats settled in their cages, he labeled each of the cages. On one cage, he labeled them smart rats. And on the other cage, he labeled them dull rats. And then he brought into his office the real subjects of the experiment, his grad students. And he asked his grad students to do what he has asked them to do a hundred times before. Go to one of the cages, grab a rat, and run some tests on that rat. So they did. They went up to one of the cages, pulled a rat out, and ran tests. And what they found on that unremarkable day was something quite remarkable. The rats that were in the cage labeled smart rats outperformed the rats that were in the cage labeled dull rats. And not by a little, by a lot. Now remember, he didn't pay attention to which rats went into which cage, and he just threw the labels up there. The students grabbed a rat out of the cage, half of them from the smart rat cage, half of them from the dull rat cage, and the ones who grabbed the rats from the smart rat cage, after they'd ran their experiments, they were superior to the ones that ran the dull rat cage. Now, Fode and Rosenthal had a bunch of theories about this. One theory was that it, because uh, uh, of the way the students were uh, positioned next to the, the rats as they were running the experiments, somehow that might have communicated which cage they thought they came from. Maybe the uh, students were gentler to the ones from the smart cage than from the dull cage. Maybe the students gave off pheromones. They often don't shower. And that was causing uh, uh, the rats to perform differently. So they ran the experiment again, and they got the same result. And again, and they got the same result. 
and they kept getting the same result over and over and over again. Somehow, the students were changing the rat's behaviors with their minds. The, they did the same experiment in schools. They would go into schools and they would tell professors that the uh, uh, children who had darker hair were naturally more talented than children who had lighter hair. And sure enough, at the end of the school year, the darker haired children were performing better on standardized tests and had better behavior overall than the lighter haired children. He went into workplaces and he told foremen that employees uh, uh, on the manufacturing floor were, uh, who had blue eyes were far more capable to do the job than employees who had dark, uh, brown eyes or, or darker color eyes. And sure enough, at the end of a year, blue-eyed employees were getting more uh, promotions and raises, and they had less absentee issues than uh, the darker-eyed employees. And they came to call this expectancy bias. Expectancy bias is once we prime someone to expect good or poor behavior from someone or something, sure enough, that's what we see. We see that behavior and we reward that behavior or we punish that behavior. And this experiment has been repeated hundreds of times and it consistently shows that our expectations change the way other people behave. So what happens when we walk into a conference room and in that conference room, there's people with the label expert designer sitting next to people with the label not a designer. What happens when we decide that people in that room are not as good a designer as others? Do they meet our expectations? Expectancy bias causes us to change outcomes. And if we want teams to perform better, we have to change our expectations. We can actually use our expectations to change the outcomes for the better. It's not a well-known fact, but I spent a little time working at the White House, and one of the people I got to work with is this person, Dana Chisnell. And Dana worked with me in the U.S. Digital Service. This is her standing in front of our office. Our boss was this guy, Mikey Dickerson. There were 250 of us, we all reported to Mikey. His boss was this guy. We called him Barry. Barry had high expectations of us, and we rose to that occasion. Now, Dana got to work on a project that I didn't get to work on. She got to work on a project that uh, involved citizenship and immigration status. It was basically taking paper applications and converting them to online. How hard can that be? Well, this particular application had six million instances every year. It could go up to 1,000 pages in length. There were 3,000 field personnel who needed to review these applications. They did that every hour of every day. And so there was a tremendous amount of work. Getting this right was really, really hard. Dana worked on a team. That team consisted of 100 developers. There were 12 technical leads, 
10 business analysts, six product managers, two product owners, and one designer named Dana. <laughs> now, Dana could have decided that she was the entire design team, but that would not have worked. There was no way she could get this done. Instead, she decided that everybody was on her design team, every single person because every single one of them would have an influence on what that transformation project would result in. When we think of who's on our team, we need to be realizing that it's anyone who can influence the rendering of intent. It no longer consists of just the trained designers in the room. Now, in order to make that happen, she had to go back to basics, which is she had to understand how they were going to understand how to design something. Now, whenever someone learns something new, they find themselves in a stage of what we call unconscious incompetence. Unconscious incompetence is what happens when we produce uh, poor outcomes, but we don't know it. Right? And you've all met people who are either learning to cook or learning to um, a new language or learning uh, uh, to, to play an instrument or learning design who have been in this situation where they are bad at what they do and they don't know how bad they are, which means they think they're pretty great. They keep giving you food and you keep tasting it and you keep thinking, this sucks. <laughs> but yet, you, know, you don't want to discourage them so you let them keep doing it. And all of us have been in this stage at some point. I mean, everything we drew up to the age of six went into the gallery on the refrigerator, and we were great artists at that point. But at some point, someone takes us aside and says, please stop. Don't do this anymore. And it's at that moment that that person realizes that there's a difference between good and poor quality. And once they realize the difference between good and poor quality, we then get them into the next stage, which is conscious incompetence. Conscious incompetence means they're still bad, but now they know it. And when they're in conscious incompetence, many people give up, they're like, I can't do anything good, I'm just not even gonna try anymore. But a few people, a few people persist. And those people start to just practice and learn and they learn the recipes and they learn the, where the fingers go on the instrument, they learn the vocabulary, they learn all the pieces and suddenly they start to produce decent outcomes. And at that point, they get to conscious competence. And conscious competence is when we can use procedures to produce really good outcomes. And it's conscious competence where we actually do most of our work. But some people suddenly will realize, well, they don't have to follow the recipe. They don't have to think about where their fingers go on the instrument. And at that moment, at that moment, they get into the final stage, which is unconscious competence. Unconscious competence is the absolute ability to understand how to make outcomes happen without thinking about it. Being able to walk in, assess the situation, and know what to do. Well, going back to Dana's situation, Dana had 130 unconsciously incompetent designers that she had to work with. And so instead of trying to approve every design, make sure that everything was there, she took a different tack. And her tack was to say, okay, how would I get 130 unconsciously incompetent designers to be at least consciously competent? And the way that she went to do this was to look at, okay, 
First, we have to think about their literacy, right? Their ability to tell the difference between good and bad design. Then, we need to think about their fluency, their ability to, with support, produce decent results by following recipes and procedures. That's how you get there. A few of them might even go on to mastery. Mastery is being able to be comprehensive, being able to understand it. When we talk about mastering our craft, this is the part we're talking about. But we hardly ever talk about making sure that the people we work with have great design literacy and understand design fluency. And that, in fact, is our job. Now, it turns out there are all sorts of strategies that we can use to do this. We call them plays because we can go onto the field and we can pull out a play from our playbook and we can apply it. But the plays change depending on which stage people are at. We have to adapt to where the people we're working with are. And that's exactly what Dana did. She created what we call an immersive exposure program. She decided if she was only going to do one thing, it was to get every single one of those 130 people to actually watch the field operatives use the designs they were creating. And as soon as she did that, as soon as she got people into the field, you could see the difference. Those people who were, never thought of themselves as designers were realizing that the stuff they were producing wasn't working. And when they came back, they fixed it. They made it better, they went back into the field, they watched it again, and they iterated. Nothing about this is radical, except that it worked. By just getting people into the field, she was able to make sure that the designs improved by having people actually get exposure to their users. That was it. This is Sid Harrell. Sid Harrell was most recently the executive director of 18F, the sister organization to the digital service. But before that, she was at a place called Code for America. And at Code for America, her responsibility was to help uh, information uh, IT leaders in um, uh, city and state local governments improve their design literacy. One of the people she got to work with was this person. His name is Jonathan Feldman. He is the CIO for the city of Asheville, a small city of about uh, uh, 400,000 people in North Carolina. And he'd never thought about design before. As a CIO, he worried about technology. He worried about what the city needed, but he never really thought about design until one day he walked into a workshop that Sid was giving at the Code for America Summit. And he and his team sat in that workshop, and in half a day, she did her best to teach him usability testing. In a half a day, you can't teach very much about usability testing, but she did it. She hacked it together. She, she actually got them all doing usability tests by assembling origami animals out of paper, because it turns out that if you just download origami instructions on the web and you ask people to do it, it's almost impossible, which makes it perfect for usability testing. So that's what she did. She, she taught them to do that. And he loved the idea of usability testing. And he and his team went back to their offices in Asheville and they started to usability test a project they were working on. And they first started by just testing it on people in the cube next door which is sort of a hack. It's not necessarily the best way to do it, but it worked. And by testing it on them, she was able to, uh, uh, he was able to, to learn about what that design was supposed to be. And as a result, he was, and his team produced this. This is an application called Simplicity. It's sort of a pun, Simplicity. And 
That's not the best part about it. The best part about it is it's completely responsive, it's completely mobile, it works. What it does is you can type in any address in the city of Asheville, North Carolina, and it will tell you everything that the city knows about that. When garbage pickup is, whether that house is connected to the sewers, what their taxes were paid, whether there's crime anywhere in the neighborhood, how many stoplights are nearby, every detail of that address is right there. And they took all the data that the city had, combined it into this one viewer, and published it. And it works, it's great. And they got to do that with a half a day's effort on just basic usability testing techniques. That was it. This is Bill Scott. Bill is the vice, senior vice president of uh, UI engineering for Venmo and PayPal. And he was chartered with taking their old legacy system and redesigning it to give an updated, better responsive uh, outcome for things like PayPal checkout. And he needed to make that happen. So he decided to assemble a small team in a conference room which in a large corporation is a very difficult thing to do. He got this team in there and he camped out for 10 months in this one conference room. And in this conference room, he brought in experts like Jeff Godelf and had them teach Lean UX to the team. And then the team went off and did this. And for the first time, a multidisciplinary team worked on a design for 10 weeks. They completely rewrote checkout, which changed the way PayPal worked all the needles moved in the right direction. And that started by just focusing on the techniques of Lean UX. Picking one thing, doing it really well. And it turns out this pattern of going in, taking teams that have never thought about design before, and making them consciously competent, that is in fact what the design process is for. That is what we're supposed to do. And that is what each of these people did. This is how we get improvement in our organizations. We think about the process such that we are always increasing the competency of the team members, getting them to be consciously competent. And it's teamwork that does this. It's setting our expectations such that we expect that they can do as well as we can. Now, Vitaly mentioned as we were coming out that uh, uh, I work at a school. We started this school to create UX designers. And we created a curriculum that is comprehensive. And what I realized after we'd created the curriculum was that almost half of the courses are team-based. The students had to learn teamwork to be able to get the work done. We had to design teamwork into the courses. Every new designer has to know how to work as a team member, and a team member that's inclusive, a team member that doesn't assume that only the designers can be designing. So we have to embrace this idea that everybody thinks they're a designer because everybody is a designer. And we have to help every team member become a better designer. That's what I came to talk to you about. Everyone is a designer. Our processes need to be a designed experience, so we have to put as much effort into how we create designs, our design process as we create our designs. Our expectations can change the way people perform, so we need to make sure we have the right expectations. Courses like facilitated leadership, where you run meetings and conduct uh, uh, exercises, that's a core skill. If we aren't teaching it, we are failing. And finally, it's our mission as design leaders to make sure that every member of the team 
is consciously competent at design. If we focus on just that one thing, design will get better across the globe. That's what I came to talk to you about. Thank you very much for encouraging my behavior. Thank you.